Hello everyone! It's so great to be uh, on, on, uh, on stage again. I, I have done some like remote talks and I hated every second of it. So now I'm going to have some audience participation and everything. I hope you're having a nice day. Uh, there was a lot of code shown today from, from uh, Daniela's great keynote from a bunch of other things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you like decompress and chill for the rest of the evening. There is some code in this talk. I promise. There's some talk, some code, but it's, it's you'll see. So uh, let's start with this. You know this man, right? Who, who knows this man? Okay, some people doesn't know this man. It's Alan Turing. You should know who he is. Uh, so he's, uh, you might recognize this building. Uh, this is the really fancy manor uh, that is around the military, well, military government place called Bletchley Park in England, which is just about here, uh, north of London, somewhere uh, halfway through Birmingham. And it's a place that is mostly known in the, during World War II because that's where the British uh, Cipher uh, Bureau was. And that's where they were uh, working on trying to crack uh, Axis uh, co codes in general. Uh, that's, that's the nice machine they made at the time, which some people say is the first computer. It's technically not a computer if you're a purist. It's the British bomb and it's technically an electromechanical machine. But it's not a general purpose computer in the sense that it can only do one thing, which is try to crack the Enigma uh, codes, basically. You cannot repurpose it to do something else. So it's technically not a computer by the purest sense. Uh, that distinction goes to ENIAC, which was made about a couple years after World War II. It's also made by Alan Turing. It's following the same principle, but it's actually general purpose. You can see those two ladies are actually trying to program it to do something uh, unlike the original one. We can only do one very specific thing. Uh, yeah, and all that stuff has been made to crack this interesting uh, piece of German engineering that we're going to be talking about for the next hour or so. So hi everybody, uh, my name is Mathieu, uh, I'm a tech lead at Paradox Development Studio, uh, I make a, a game called Hearts of Iron, I've been working in other games in the past in the same company. Uh, you can find me in those uh, very unmatching uh, handles, use the Twitter one while you can. Uh, and I have a blog that I post in very, very sporadically. Uh, so uh, I might post a second post this year as a trip report, but it's, I, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I'm, I'm very sporadic on, on how, far, how, how much I post there. So what is this talk about? Why are we here, right? We're gonna talk about cryptography. Uh, we're gonna talk about how we break ciphers. We're gonna talk about history. I mean, you know, if you don't know me, I like to talk about history. There's a reason why I ended up at Paradox. Uh, and there's some code, and it's even modern, you'll see. So as every good talks, uh, it started with a tweet, uh, which was made by my game director as a teaser for, my, uh, for, for, for an upcoming uh, expansion, where he, he gave people like a, basically a, an enciphered message with the Enigma machine, and then he gave them a bunch of clues on how to decode it. Like for example, if you're familiar with Enigma, if you see Roman letters, that's, the, that's which waters you're supposed to place. I'll, I'll explain how the machine works in a minute. But, I saw that tweet and I came back to him and said, but, but you, you gave them everything already, right? Like they have, they have the wheel order, they even have some like plain text that they can use to crack stuff. Like, like if they're gonna chuck this thing in an Enigma simulator, it's gonna be done. Like it's 2022, right? Like you should just give them zero clue and they should be able to crack it, right? And he says, oh yeah, but I don't know how much time the fans would make to actually manage to crack it. And you know, maybe we would be late on our marketing plan, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's a teaser, right? It's not supposed to be a, a very big thing. And after a moment I sat down, I was like, wait, I just said like, of course it should be crackable by any machine modern, by any modern machine, right? Because it's like, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a mechanical device invented in the twenties. Like there is no way a modern computer cannot break that easily, right? Or can it? And basically the rest of this talk is who would win? Like two nerds with a bunch of PhDs from the 30s or my uh, machine and me who is really bad at math or cryptography but I have a lot of cores and I don't even think Turing could dream about this thing uh, in his better days. So let's see. So to explain a bit how that works, first I'm gonna explain a bit uh, the Enigma machine and exactly where it come from. So you know, we start with a very common quote, maybe the most overused quote ever. All warfare is based on deception. Why am I saying that? Well, if you've never heard about warfare, I'm gonna give you like a very quick one through if you've never played any of my games. So bigger number usually wins in a battle. Uh, a bunch of our players have complained about that and we keep saying that that's, that's expected, that's, that's how that works. Uh, 
So of course, if the enemy has more numbers, you just try to hit them when they are not. That's that's the that's the basic thing, right? And radio was invented in the like radio communication democratized itself in the 20s and 30s, and that became a tremendous uh, help to coordinate attacks and uh, and try to outflank your enemies, which was a lot seen a lot in the opening moves of World War II. Uh, the problem is if the enemy can listen to your radio, then well, you lose the element of surprise and they're waiting for you, which is not good. So obviously you need a way to be able to transmit message over the air, but somehow if your an, uh, enemy just intercepts the signal, they can't make any sense of it. And hence comes cryptography. Uh, this device was invented somewhere, we're not entirely sure exactly, the patent is a bit confusing. Late at the end of World War I slash the, 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 uh, the year forming, uh, the, the, the years after that. It was made for commercial markets originally. It was like to protect yourself from uh, spies, uh, like corporate espionage and stuff like that. You would send your internal memos about your patents and your research uh, through, through these machines. And again, I have to stress out, there is no electronics in this. It's, it's made in the 1980s, uh, 1918, 1920s. It's, it's a bunch of routers, some wires, lamps, a battery, and some soldering. That's it. And that's how the whole thing works. Uh, it is self-powered and it's portable, which the German army liked very much very early, because again, you can put it in an armored vehicle, you can put it in a submarine, and it's pretty good to encipher Morse messages because the only thing it enciphers is like letters from A to Z, which is perfect if you're sending Morse. Uh, and, and you can see, like, for that's Heinz Guderian in the Battle of France trying to coordinate uh, how to uh, bypass the Arden and over bad memories. Anywho, so <laughs> that's a router from the Enigma machine. It looks weird and maybe scary, but it's really simple. The only thing it does is that you have like 26 entry pins on one hand, and you have 26 out, uh, uh, out uh, exit pins on the other hand, and then you have a bunch of wires that just scramble where the electrical pathway goes. And basically, each pin is a letter. There's 26. That's the point, right? So if you get a if you get a signal that would mean to be an A, well, you follow the wire and you end up I don't know maybe like on a, on a Z or something like that. It's it's basically implementing a very simple like substitution cipher like you've probably learned if you took any simple like cryptographic class. Like it's 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 an ad advanced Caesar cipher because you don't have the same offset for every uh, character. It's just like every letter maps to another letter and that's it. That's what it does. It's it's really dumb. Uh, and they're already pre-made, right? Like they don't, you can't reconfigure them on the, reconfigure them on the fly. They're factory made. Uh, uh, Ten in total were made for the Enigma machine. Originally, the first model had three. There, you only had three, three, three different uh, uh, routers. So how do you, how do you enact complexity, cryptographic safety from this? Because this is obviously trivial to crack, right? Like it's a simple substitution cipher. You just use a frequency table and you're done. It's really, really dumb to to crack. So the complexity is that when you start chaining them, and then you start having the, um, the, the rotors turn every time you press a key, but they don't all turn. The, the, right was, uh, the rightmost one turn every time you press a key on the keyboard, but then the other one only turns every 26 strokes because there's like a small uh, pen somewhere that would just grab the next wheel once every 26 revolution and make it turn again. And so basically every time you click, every time you type uh, on the keyboard, the electrical pathway just gets reconfigured inside and the substitution cipher changes. So frequency analysis doesn't work anymore because it changes every stroke. And the more wheels you have, the more it changes every time you type. And that's basically how they made uh, like a very simple uh, concept of substitution just become harder to crack. Because again, if you don't know when they're gonna turn and what their original position, the text is just garbage. You can't really make much out of it. It's also meant to be portable, so there's no printer in it. Like, you don't type text and get something out. What happens is when the, uh, when the electrical current, wrench, which comes from the right side, like on, the, on this side, it comes from that side and it exits on this side. When the electrical uh, signal that you, you, you got from, uh, from typing a key on the keyboard arrives to the left side, what it does is that it enters this uh, static uh, reflector, which basically just remaps every letter to another one. And then the signal is bounced back again. So basically, you would like exit here, for example, through the reflector, you would get there, and then boom, you would pass through the machine again, and then exit through another pathway. It has one special property, which is every time you type a key, there is no way the same key gets out, because obviously the electrical current has to travel and get somewhere else. And then you get that electrical current, and that's the lamp you light on top of your keyboard, and that tells you which letter it's supposed to be enciphered. And then you have someone on the side that is just copying as, as you type, like, what is the output? That's basically how that works. And so that's the that's the that's basically the the thing. It's just like 
Every time I type a keystroke, one of the 26 on the right uh, hand side of the, of, the, of the rotor gets this uh, electrical signal. It travels uh, through, the, through the circuits with like an order that changes every keystroke because the rotor turn. It comes back, and then one of the, one of the 26 lamp lights up, and that's my output. That's really ingenious for, for what it is. Uh, let's look at the complexity now, okay? So you have three orders, you can put them in any order. I'm bad at math, but that's three times two times one, right? Because you can only pick like, uh, you have one, three choice for the first one, then two, then one. That's because you only have one more rotor. That's six, okay. And then you have to know, uh, in a, you have to know what, what, uh, where the rotor was positioned when the message started. And that gives you about 17,000 uh, 17, potential keys. If we multiply those two together, that's 105 possible combinations. That's probably good enough to defeat someone who is just trying to brute force all your keys on paper. But as soon as someone gets a bit smart, that's probably not good enough. It's, you might have thought like in the early 1920s at the end of World War I when everybody was tired, uh, that might have been good enough. But very quickly, it starts being possible to find attacks. So of course, uh, they decided to upgrade it. So the first thing they did is they added like a, a ring setting on every rotor that is configurable, and that changes when it will take the next when the next will move. Instead of being like every time you eat A, it's every time you eat whatever letter you configured. And then that also means that you cannot predict, the attacker cannot predict when the second rotor and then the third rotor will also turn. And that also scrambles the message at, after some point. Uh, and yeah, that's the point, you change the turnover position. Uh, the military, the German military thought this was not enough, so they introduced a plug board. And the plug board is really simple again. It's just like you have all the letters, and then you have a bunch of uh, stackers, as they call them in German, plugs, and you just make pairs with them. And what it does is just, it just remaps the electrical current. It's another substitution cipher on top, basically, but the difference is not every letter is paired with another letter. You, you have, at the, uh, originally I think they had like six uh, cables like that, in, later in the war they had ten. And when you set up the machine, you take about, you take ten of those and you make pairs. And again, it's, it's, it's something you agree with the other party when you're about to talk. But if the other part, if, if the pair of people's eavesdropping do not know, they probably get garbage again, because it's just another cipher, uh, another substitution on top. That was still not enough. They were still afraid that they could be, uh, the, the code could be read. So they, uh, they added more rotors originally. Like instead of three rotors, you had five and then eight. That was still like, mm, is it enough? So someone figured, what if we shrink the reflector that, that, that is at the end, and then we make a smaller rotor and we fit it there. So technically, we have four rotors now instead of, uh, instead of, uh, instead of three. Of course, since that rotor has a different size, because you basically they, they, they retrofitted it in the same box, they didn't want to change the shape of the machine. It cannot be replaced by the original one, so there's only two that you can have at the end. You can't have like the full combination of if there was actually ten rotors. And that's the Kriegsmarine uh, M4, which is the, considered the best Enigma machine during the war. That's the one that was used by the U-boats. Uh, so, okay, let's go again. We have four rotors out of ten, so uh, two options for the first one, and then it's uh, eight, then seven, then six. That's uh, 672. Uh, then you have like the initial rot, like the key, whatever, where, where, on which letter are the rotors initially placed uh, when you start enciphering the message. That's about like for 24, 26 times four, like 456 uh, thousand. Uh, then you have the initial rotor setting. The, 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 the last rotor doesn't ma matter because it does not turn another rotor left to it, right? Because it's the last one. So it doesn't matter which setting it has. So only the first, the last three counts because that's the only one that can turn. Uh, so that's still like 17,000 options. And finally, you have, you make 10 combination out of 26. I'm really bad at combination, but, uh, but some math tell me that it's like 150 whatever trillion. It's, it's a big number, it's a, it's a, it's a big number. Uh, if you multiply all that together, that's about, uh, yeah, uh, 10 to the power of 26 uh, combination. That's, I don't even know what units that means. But roughly speaking, it's 62 bits encryption. Roughly speaking. And again, I wanna stress that, it's 62 bits inscription with a bunch of wheels, a few wires, some soldering, a lamp, and a battery. And that fits in a car. Which, again, for 1930s, impressive. I'm not gonna lie. So how do you work? Like, if you're, if you're a, a, a German operator, which technically the Japanese and the Italian had some machines too, but mostly we're talking about the German one here. 
Uh, you install the routers, right? Uh, usually the configuration of like the, uh, which order they were put in the machine changed every month. And then as the war progressed, they changed it every week and even sometime every day. Because they're like, uh, what, if, what if somehow they got the combination through, through spies? We better change that more often. Uh, you set the ring settings on each router, like when are they going to actually turn over. Uh, then you set up the plug board, like you, 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 you plug the, uh, the pairs. As, uh, as, as instructed by basically every, every site has a code book and we just have the keys for the day. Uh, then you have a daily key, that's where you set the position of the routers. And then they did something quite smart. Instead of immediately enciphering your message, you pick another key, you encipher that key uh, with, the, with, the, with the daily key, which is only four characters, right, because you have four routers. And then you reset the position to the key you've just decided, and then you type your message. It's a classic thing that you do in cryptography, right? You do not actually encode the whole message with a big key. Like, for example, if you do uh, RSA encryption to, to, talk, to talk to someone, you only use RSA to change a key, and then you use that, trash, uh, that, 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 that uh, throwaway key for the rest of the communication. The point is, if someone has a lot of messages, they don't actually use the same key for, the max, for most of the length of the message, so you cannot base uh, like you can use a bunch of statistics to help you out crack like uh, things that keep repeating, for example. Because, for example, if you had the same word at the same place or the same letters at the same place, and you use the same key for every message, like someone with this dropping could start looking at patterns and say, like, hey, this letter keeps repeating at the same place. That sounds weird. Like maybe there w maybe we're onto something. So the way you defeat that is that you only use the the daily key to encipher four characters and then you actually use a completely randomly generated key, and that kind of breaks some of the attempt at, uh, at, at using those methods. That works pretty well. And yeah, basically you type your message, and then you append the actual key that you enciphered at first, and then you send that over. Cool. So now you're probably wondering, okay, it's the 1940s, how did they manage to break 60 bits encryption? Uh, for reference, 60 bits encryption, I have a slide later, is where we started, like when we started uh, having RS, uh, S, uh, SHA-1 be, have enough collision that you could make an attack with 60 bits, we said, okay, it's time to retire it because someone with a 2020 machine and about $100,000 can generate a collision. But that's, again, with a 2020 machine uh, and set up. Like, they obviously didn't have that in the 1940s, so how did they manage? Right, so uh, let's go back a bit. It's, uh, it's 1930s, uh, you're Poland, and you kind of know that your neighbors are up to no good. So you start a, a cryptography bureau. Uh, they hired this man, who knows this guy? Ah, are you Polish? Yes. <laughs> Not surprising. Uh, this man is, I discovered during my research, he's uh, Marian Rejewski. He's a Polish mathematician. He was actually a PhD student, I think, in 1932 when he was hired by the Polish Cypher Bureau. And they say, hey, you seem to do math. Uh, can you help us crack those German codes? He impressively managed to uh, reverse engineer a lot of stuff just based on the sales documentation of Enigma. He had the, the, the public sales documentation they had like for the industry trying to sell their machine to the, to the private sector. And in them, they had some examples of enciphered message and plain text message. And just based on that and a rough idea of how it worked, he reverse engineered the routers, the router positions. And then he actually designed a thing called the Bomba, which if you remember the British bomb, it's because it's basically the same idea. And he shared all his research in uh, July 39. And that's the machine he built uh, in Poland uh, in the mid to late 30s, which is called the Bomba. The Bomba, I'm not going to even try to pronounce Polish. Uh, basically what it does is that it uses a flow in the German uh, protocols, because Germans are very protocolary, as we all know. And uh, I, when I wrote this talk, I didn't realize I would be doing it in Berlin. So uh, my apologies for the German jokes. Uh, so the thing was, at first, the German operators were afraid that if one of the three first characters was garbled, you would actually be unable to read the rest of the message because that's where the key is. So they repeated it twice, every time. And that gives a very interesting property in the message. You know that every message, the first and the, third, the fourth character, the, well, or, or, you know, offsetting, the, the second and the, uh, and, the, and, the, and the fifth character, the third and the sixth character, all the same. You, they, they, they don't look the same because Enigma and the rudders, but you know that those characters are all the same. They have a property that, you, you have a property there that you know means that there is something. And it's really unlikely, if you get the wrong key, that you would get those three properties validated at the same time. Because, because math and statistics and a bunch of other stuff I don't entirely understand. And so what did he do? He just said, okay, I'm gonna build a mechanical machine 
six of them actually. Each one of them would be designed for each pot potential rotor orders in the, that they had in the 30s. And they're just going to brute force all combination very quickly with just electrical pathways and stop when this property is validated. And if it does, you probably broke the daily key. And that was good enough. Uh, basically, in the 30s, they were able to read most of the German traffic. And they showed up in the nick of time in July 39, uh, July 39 to the Allies and said, you know those German texts, you had no idea what they were about? Yeah, we cracked it. Here is the method. They shared everything with this. And that's how the British got started with it. I don't, I don't want to diss on Turing or anything, but he got a huge head start due to Polish research. Basically, the British bomb is just, is just uh, the Polish bomb, but, but improved and refined so that some of the other bits were configurable. Uh, one of the main things that they had to change was that the Germans realized that repeating the key was dangerous at some point, like their, their, their cryptography unit warned them that this is a potential weakness in the cipher, so please stop. Which meant they had to find another way to figure out something in the message that would give them a clue that this was probably the right key. And they used a the thing they called cribs, which is like bits of messages that were likely to be at the same position uh, every time. Uh, and again, Germans being German, they are really formal about what they say. Uh, for example, uh, Rommel's uh, uh, personal assi uh, assistant who typed all his message always started every message with the same uh, uh, politeness formula, every time, greetings, blah, blah, blah. So they knew that it was coming from him, they had to look for the for, for decipher of those exact words in the plain text, and they had the key. And there was a few other things that you could do. A lot of messages started with like an, uh, to, someone. So you could also know that there was the three characters were always the same. A bunch of things like that. They were looking for common words that usually appeared at the same place. They called them cribs. And so what the, the, the bomb made by the British did is that instead of looking for a static uh, combination of characters, you could program which characters you expected at which place. And then it would do the same thing. It would just brute force all combination and stop when there was a potential match, and then they would manually try out the 10 or 20 that, that the machine would give out until they found the one that was correct. <coughs> uh, that worked pretty well. They read most of the German ciphers for most of the war. Like at most days, they had at, at worst like 40 hours delay uh, before they could actually get the messages. Uh, yeah. And the funny bit is, after the war, uh, the, the um, not the CIA because they did not, but the, the British and the American uh, uh, intelligence agencies, they interrogated some uh, German prisoners of war that worked for the Abwehr, the German, uh, the German um, uh, spy uh, agency, and they asked them, like, do you know we cracked Enigma? And the guy was like, no, we thought it was theoretically possible, but every time we tried to make an assessment, and several times they ordered an assessment, like, can they read our codes, yes or no? The conclusion was like, no way. Like, I think it's luck. They just guess where convoys were going to be or something like that. It's theoretically possible to break, but, but I don't think they would have the means or they would be willing to put the means to crack this. Again, they didn't know about the bomber or the bombs, so they assumed that you had to do it with a way more laborious way. And they're like, I mean, it's technically possible if you have like a million people. Just, just I don't think they're going to do that. And yeah, until the end, they were convinced that Enigma was safe. It wasn't. Spoiler warning. Right, okay, so that's a lot of history. That's the bit I love, but maybe at some point you want to care about how do we actually break that on a modern computer. It's not that computer, by the way, because this, this CPU is crap, but uh, I have a nice 7th, uh, 10th generation at home with, uh, with things in cores. Let's see how that goes. So, ha, I like, there's some more history. Um, so here's the data set. So uh, this U-boat is a U-534. Uh, it was sunk off of the coast of Norway uh, just before the end of the war. Uh, it, was found in, uh, it was found by an archaeologist in the, in the 80s, and it was ready in the 90s. You can actually visit it. I can't remember if it's in Scotland or in Norway, but you can visit it today. Uh, and it's pretty well preserved. And interestingly inside, they found a bunch of, uh, of uh, decrypts that had just been received, but no keys, because again, uh, the Germans were not completely stupid about how that works. They knew that if you captured a sub, you would get the keybook. So the keybook are actually were, uh, written with an ink that is water soluble. So if the sub sinks, you can't read the keybook. You can only see whatever they wrote on pencils with the actual uh, ciphers they got. Uh, so someone actually tried before me to crack this. In 2012, a man named uh, Michael Orenberg uh, started a project to crack it. If you remember, the two, early 2010 was when we had like all the uh, city at home and cancer at home. It was kind of like Bitcoin, but with an actual point. Uh, 
so yeah, you would basically add your computer to a cloud and it would try to just do a bunch of computation and find something. So it created Enigma at home, which was just like, hey, everyone who joins this, uh, this botnet uh, will try to, uh, to crack some, uh, we'll try some keys until we find something. He managed to crack most of them in the 2010s, but that was the 2010s, that was, that was, that was the dark ages. Can we do it with a single machine today? Uh, we're going to focus on this one message. Uh, it's been codenamed P103061 by, uh, by its founder. It's 370 character long, which is, I mean, it's going to help us because it's pretty long, but it's not oversized. I think the German recommendation was keep it under 400 characters. It was initially clocked in October 2012, and it reads like this, which, I mean, it's Enigma and Cypher, obviously, like, whatever, right? Uh, if you translate it uh, to actual uh, decipher, it looks like this, which also looks like garbage, but it's actually German, and I know I can't really tell the difference, but if you start looking more closely, <laughs> you start looking words like Reichsmarkel, Goering, Führer, Admiral, Reich, Bormann. I'm not a big expert on German, but that sounds like a thing the Germans would be saying in 1940. So, uh, that text was actually sent in uh, May 1944, and it's a message that announced that the Grand Admiral Donitz is now in overall command in Germany. For those who know history, that means that most of the big shots are dead, missing, or have surrendered. And a couple days later, you would see uh, Admiral Donitz actually surrendering to the Allies. Uh, this is the British uh, who, uh, who arrested them in, uh, in, in the West at the time. So I think it's an interesting piece of history. Uh, let's see how we can crack it. All right, let's do some number crunching real quick, right? So as I said before, 62 bit force is the equivalent of uh, cracking an SHA-1 collision. If I could crack an SHA-1 for that price, I would not be here. I would be on some remote island paid by some, I mean, no. But maybe we can try to do better. So uh, what if we remove the plug board? We will figure out later. Let's say we can figure out later how to crack without the plug board, okay? So let's, let's, let's do without first. That's five trillion combination. I'm not 100% sure of how many gigaflops my uh, computer can do, but that still sounds like a lot. So, um, actually, let's try to be smart. Uh, you know, like, uh, every rotor is supposed to turn, right? But in practice, the one on the left is probably never going to turn because you need 26 rotation for the, first one, for the, for the, for the third wheel to turn, right? Then you need 26 times 26 for the, for, the, for, the, for the second one to turn. And for the final one to turn, you need 26 by 26 by 26. That's bigger than most message keys. So in practice, the leftmost wheel will never turn most of the time on most messages, or it will turn very early or very late, and the rest of the message will still be intelligible. We can just bet that it will not turn, which is a safe bet, assuming the length of the key. And with that, we reduce it to 208 billion. I mean, I don't know, that's the number, but the number is billions sounds like a thing I can, like, you know, like, there, uh, there's like, there's like four billion in 32 bits. That starts looking like numbers I'm used to talk about in computer. So maybe that's a good bet. That's a good start. I'm not talking every day about four billions. I'm just reassuring you. My, my games are not that complex. But, uh, you know, it's, it starts being like a, an order of magnitude we can think about. That make, eh, maybe I can crack this. So uh, we'll make an algorithm, and it's going to be really dumb. We're going to try every rotor permutation, so 2 times 8 I, uh, times 8. Uh, uh, we're going to try every ring setting for the 3rd for the and the 4th uh, rotors. We're going to ignore the, 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 first, uh, the second one. Then we're going to try every possible key, 26, 26, 26, and that's a bunch of for loops. And if you look at my code, it's really, really stupid. With like that. You need a lot of tabs. Uh, and then we see if we match the plain text. No, no, because that's basically what the allies did, right? They, they had cribs, they had bets that they expected to be there, we're just going to see if it matches. We're not going to try to do anything like a pure ciphertext attack or anything for now. We're just going to say, hey, we suspect that, this is the, that, we, that the message is there. Is that the right key? Again, the reason why they did that is that once you manage to crack one message with like expected bits and you got it, then you get the daily key, and then you can read anything else that, that, that has been sent during the day, or even worse, if they don't change the key every day. And that's good enough. That's all you need, right? You need one weak message during the day that you can crack, and then you can read all the traffic, because from there you get the daily key. That's the, that's the entire point of it. So, I mean, sure. Maybe, for example, since it's a big announcement, and that, that's a thing that they did historically, if a big announcement is sent to the whole country, like something like the overall commander-in-chief changing, you might assume that the U-boat will probably get the same message, but enciphered, so if you get a message that's roughly the same length, you're like, eh, maybe if we just got a copy of it, can we just try and see if that works? So let's see. All right, we, uh, we test that uh, big number of permutation. That's uh, 200, 200 billion on worst case. You know, if we're lucky and actually the first setting we try is the right one, it terminates immediately. 
it's just unlikely. All right, so uh, I run this and I made some like rough estimate code. Uh, I based this on Windows copy function, so it's absolutely wrong. It's probably like off by, I don't know, one to three or something like that. It's, it's, it's an estimate, right? It's, it's a, yeah, it's about that good. Uh, but that gives, you, that gives you an idea, right? It's 3,000 minutes to, uh, to try all the permutation, roughly speaking. I did not let it run all night. I had other things to do. But roughly speaking, 52 hours. So we're talking days, basically, to crack this message. Possible, but it's going to take us days to, uh, to exhaust all the possible uh, combination. Before I go into more optimization, let's see how that works. Just, just to see, like, if you want to see the main loop and see maybe if you see some optimization options. So it's, it's really simple, right? We, uh, every time we have the input, and by input I mean basically a letter, uh, I started by using offsets, but I realized I could just use ASCII characters and that just didn't change the performance. There's way easier to debug to see when you're looking at the state machine, like which character is actually in or out, because you can compare it to an actual Enigma simulator you find on the internet. So, okay, we take the plug board, we take the input minus A, and we say, okay, which letter do we map? That's the first step, yeah, just passing through the plug board. Okay, then we go through the first order, and we account for the wiring, and where, which offset is actually at because it's turning. Uh, and then we do that for the second rudder using the input of the previous rudder, blah, blah, blah. We do that for the four rudders. That's, that's what it do. And then we go through the reflector, and we get a letter out, and then we go the other way around. We go through the rudders in reverse. So basically, you have to do a reverse lookup on the same table, because you're coming left to right instead of right to left. Uh, and, 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 you know, like the, ma the mapping are not one to one, right? So, for, for, for example, like if a rudder A gets Z out, the, uh, out of the other side, uh, it doesn't, uh, yeah, it's, it's not guaranteed to be in a, 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 a recursive match. So, you have to have a reverse table to map it. Uh, you, do, you do that for everything, uh, and then there's like a weird entry wheel thing that's added later. It doesn't really matter, it's just, just, just a thing. Uh, and then you go through the plug board again, and you have your, uh, you have your output. Uh, this, 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 this function has one big problem. Uh, your CPU hates it, because all this computation depends on the previous result, right? Every time you go through a, through a router, you cannot, like, you know, a, 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 a modern CPUs, they really love to try to do out of order execution. Uh, and if there's a bunch of like simple math and lookups in tables, they could try to execute all that at the same time, but they can't because every time they have to do a lookup with one of those square bracket operator, the, the index they're looking up depends on the previous instruction, so they have no choice but to wait on the previous instruction before they can go. You can't vectorize this, for example, which is a shame, especially with modern CPUs, which are really like being optimized to do every, everything like that. So, <sighs> A router is just 26 character string, right? So what we do is that we generate the, the forward and the reverse uh, wiring array at compile time. That's the, that's what we're starting to have some C++ modern stuff in there. Uh, I, I base some of this implementation of the Enigma at home, which is in C. And in C, you have like huge tables, like uh, three times 26 that are static variables. And then you have the reverse mapping table, which is the same table, but reversed three times. And you have to squint to make sure that one character is an off. Uh, my implementation is a bit smarter because, again, I use a context spur like 26 uh, long array. And then at compile time, I just uh, duplicate it two times and then I, I, re I, I, re I reverse the, uh, I generate the reverse mapping two, three times too. Why three times? I'll explain it in a minute. It's because we want to avoid the modulo. Let me explain. So this is our Enigma machine, right? You have uh, the router simulation. You have like, you have ABC blah, blah, blah coming in and you have some random, uh, some random like letters coming out. This is one of, the, I think if it's the first, the mapping of the first uh, official router. So that's what happened. And every time I type a character, the, uh, the wheel turns, blah, blah, like this. Yeah, okay, you can get, the, you get it. So the mapping changes. That's the ID. So, so if, you wanna, if you wanna write it down as a, as a code, it sounds pretty easy at first, right? It's just, what is the output? Well, you take the wiring table you take the input uh, that is like, you know, uh, from 0 to 26, uh, no, 0 to 25, sorry, counting from 0, plus the offset, which is like the current position of the rudder because it keeps turning, and you get the letter out, right? That sounds easy enough, but there's a problem with that. You might go over or under because, again, you're adding like a number from 0 to 25 to an offset, which is from 0 to 25, so you might end up like here or you might end up like here. Like, it, it's not good. You, you will... You will potentially go out of memory, so you can't do that. And obviously, the naive way is to just add a modulo, right? You just you modulo your offset because the wheel is supposed to be a again. The time is uh, the wheel is a circle, and with that, you know how to go back to your original uh, thing. 
But that's that's a problem, and why? Because that's the assembly of that very simple like uh, wiring option that I just made, right? And I'm not a big expert on uh, on everything, but that sounds like a lot of instruction. Like to just do a lookup with a modulo 26, I don't know, there's a multiplication, a bunch of like shifts, uh, another multiplication, I don't like this. Okay, so what if we're smart and you said we duplicate the wheel two times? Then we can take the offset and add 26 and it doesn't matter where we land, we will always be in the valid memory that is just a copy and that simulates the fact that the thing is, uh, is round. That's a trick I stole from the actual uh, C implementation, but that saves us a lot. And by a lot, I mean this is the, this is the version with a modulo. Uh, this is the version without the module that just does math. Uh, you might notice a small difference here. There's a plus 26. Uh, it turns out uh, this instruction and this instruction have the exact same cost uh, because uh, if you do like some register add, register add or register add plus, plus a constant is exactly the same uh, ops time on a modern CPU. They don't care. This is one of the reasons I dropped the, uh, my main digital implementation that did not use a ASCII string but use numbers. Because as it turned out, subtracting and adding a constant every time does not matter for a CPU. It doesn't care. It's like, it's plus minus like epsilon. I don't give a fuck, it's just as many instructions. And if you look even closely, you realize, hey, that's the same thing. Like all of that is computing the module and then you just have a lookup with the actual final index. So we just skip the whole thing. That, that, that changes a lot. That's, that's still included in my first benchmark. That still takes 52 hours, but just as, a, as an aside, uh, of a small like optimization that I found that I felt really interesting to look at. But of course, like that machine has 16 or 32 cores or whatever, like we could do better, right? Like we could multi-thread, that's the thing. My machine has eight uh, physical cores, 16 logical cores. Uh, let's use threads, let's go. Like we have 16 cores, equivalent. So, you know, 50 hours divided by 16, roughly speaking, three and a half hour and we should be done. And we have C++ 17, so now it's easy, right? You, you take one of the outermost loops. So for example, the one that, uh, the one that goes through, the, through like the 26 possible like, uh, characters of the key. Uh, and you just you generate an array of 26 possible value. You just make, instead of having a for loop from zero to 25, uh, you, make a, you make a for loop with a, for each with a, with a stud execution par and sec, uh, par extra parameter, and that's it. Oh, sorry, I, I forgot to put some block here. But that's it, like that's the only thing I had to change. I took my for loop, I replaced it from like a for each for like from a zero to 26. Uh, the reason why you need, a, you need like a, a container is because like the, um, the, the for loop will try to break down the, this thing for like every thread, so every thread needs to be getting a value. Uh, 26 does not actually entirely scale to 16 threads, so you will have some that are done and some that are not. It's not perfect parallelism by any mean. But it's okay enough to, 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 to reduce the problem. And again, like it took me five minutes to do that change. And on Windows, uh, it just used exactly as many cores I have, as I have available. It did not spawn more thread or less thread. I just looked at it. And I could see my machine doing like 100% CPU for the whole time. And yeah, I don't have another extra here, but it was basically like the, the, the estimation where it would take three and a half hours to crack. So, okay. We got that out of the box. That's pretty nice. And that's really not a lot to, to write and use. And I, I, really, I, I really like that bit. But maybe we can do better, because that's still a bit slow, uh, slow to crack. So let's start continuing thinking about those rotors that turn. Like the second rotor, right, the, 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 one, the second one, it doesn't turn that much either. Like the, third, the first one never, basically never turns for, for the old purpose and intents. But the second one, like it will turn between 169 keystrokes and 676, right, because it's either 26 by 26, and then later on, the, 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 the German Navy added some fast turning wheels, which would turn twice uh, every 13 and 26 character. So, you know, between 169, 13 by 13, or uh, 676, that's how fast it would turn. But what does that mean for us? That means that even if they use the fast turning wheels, we still get a quarter of the message absolutely verbatim. Uh, verbatim, even if we get the the uh, the wheel order wrong, because it would turn at the wrong moment, so it would be correct, 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 and then garbage, or the other way around. It would turn very early, and then at some point it would just match itself uh, back, and then you will still have correct thing until the next 170 characters. And you know what? A quarter is good enough, right? If I have a perfect match of 160 characters out of like 400 of uh, of German ciphertext, I'm good. Like, I, there's no way, statistically speaking, I got something that is that is random. So we can just ignore that, and then we can just fine tune afterwards, right, to just get the rest of the message correct. So uh, we basically do uh, only, only the, the, the last, uh, we only test some ring setting, 
until we find a partial match. And once we have a partial match, we just fine tune the rest. And the search space goes down to like 8 billions. And 8 billions, again, two times 32 bets, but uh, 30. But you know what? Six minutes with my great estimate, which means probably more like 10. But again, we started with like a time in days. Uh, with multi funding, we got two hours. And now we're about minutes, maybe tens of minutes, if we're like, if my estimate is incorrect, which it is. That's still reasonable, right? We start getting, get so we can start getting somewhere. But someone will start at some point and say, but what about the plug ball, Matthew? You basically cheated and say, okay, what if we ignore this like 150 trillion uh, uh, part of the equation? Like, yeah, uh, easy, right? So uh, that's a lot, right? 150 trillion multiplied with the original search space. Like, we already tried to reduce it as much as we can to get down. How are we going to get back up to that number? I don't know how. We're not going to brute force this. Can we split the problem? Can we get around it? Let's see. So um, let's start with a basic assumption. We have 26 letters, and we know that 20, them, 20 of them are, plug, uh, are plugged, and so basically are garbled. But that means that six of them are correct. That means that six characters, when inputs, would actually give the right sequence, because it doesn't matter which character I type. It doesn't affect the rest of the thing. It just, the number of characters affect the, 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 the wheel order, right, because of the turn, but not the character itself that I type. So even if I get it wrong, about one in six, one in four character will be correct compared to the original. So uh, what if we just try ignoring the plug ball entirely? Just say, you know what? We don't know what the plug ball is. Just try to crack it anyway. And uh, count how many matches we got and only keep the top six because we know that the other one are just garbage. And say, hey, can we get over a certain threshold of characters that matches uh, with only six matches, uh, with only six picks? And is that good enough? Which, you know, that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the, the one that we're stacked for that message. Uh, A and E, B and F, blah, 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 blah. And that's the table of how many matches we got on the, uh, with the right key and the right, uh, the right settings. So the red ones are, are wrong matches, like right? those letters are, are incorrect. Uh, and the blue one are false positives, right? It's the one you think they are correct, but they're not in the right place. Like you, you, and I think the reason why is because A and E are very common characters and they're basically stacked together. Uh, but all the other ones, like I have a four score here, a five score here, one, six, and two. And as you can see, like most characters that are wrong, they just have a very low score. But all the ones that are correct, they roughly, sp they, they stand out, like statistically speaking. I'm still getting a four because S is uh, plugged with Z. Uh, but, you know, even with that, that, is that enough noise to defeat us is the question. And as it turns out, it is not. If you assume that basically, if you get about a tenth of the message characters correct, roughly speaking, uh, you know what, that's good enough. If you have a tenth of the characters at the right place, you can probably assume that you got the right plug board and then you can just fine tune the, the plugs after that to figure out which one leads you to the correct one. And again, uh, a big thing about Enigma is like playing Mastermind, or if you're more, or if you're younger, whatever Waddle is, or whatever those things, right? You know, what I, every time you plug a thing and you're not correct, it tells you, "Hey, keep going, you're going the right way," and that is the main flow of Enigma, right? And that's I think you should have probably figured that out by now. The main flow of Enigma is, contrary to like modern algorithm, it's not a pure 62-bit cipher. As as I get closer and closer to the solution the message starts looking more and more like the current one, which is great if you make a video game. It's terrible if you're trying to make encryption because that you really don't want that property. But that's the thing. And with that, we can absolutely abuse the fact and reduce the complexity. Like It's kind of a collision attack, I think, that they call on, uh, on, on modern cryptography. Yeah, but can we do better? All right, so uh, what if we ignore all the rings? Like, you know what, screw it. Like, it's going to turn. It's gonna turn at the wrong time, and then like some of the message will be garbled, and then we'll we'll actually turn again. Like the the, 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 the like the second wheel will start wrong, probably speaking. But at, after after about up to 25 characters, it will be right again, and then we'll have like we'll have sequence that are correct until the turnover happens, and then they will be wrong, and then after 10, 20 characters, they'll be correct again. Uh, it will be wrong, but can we get enough fragments that are correct to distinguish that from noise? Uh, and then after that, we can just do like a 26 time uh, power of free uh, pass to just fine tune the, the actual uh, ring settings, but that's nothing. Um, so let's see. Oh, wow, it's pretty fast. All right. Yeah, I guess it's done. It actually worked. Uh, yeah, it take, I mean, the 80 zero minutes is about as correct as my rest of my estimates actually took like one. 
But yeah, uh, without the actual keyboard and without knowing, uh, even trying, we just we find the right waters, we find the message key, and then we just tweak the ring settings to get to 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 to, to ungobble the rest of the message, and we're good. Uh, I didn't do the math, and I'm not a good mathematician, as, as explained for the rest of this talk. So there is a distinct possibility that I got lucky, uh, because that's a long message, and maybe the, the, the star were lining correctly with, my, uh, with, my, with, with, the, with, the, with the stickers they used that day. Might not work with all messages, especially, like, I think if they have 50 characters long, it's going to be a problem. But something like 300 and something, it seems to be working pretty good. Uh, I will potentially, when, if I redo this talk in the future uh, and have more time, think about some other stuff. Like there's a thing called index of coincidence, which is a mathematical formula that looks at character frequency and says, what are the odds that this text is garbage compared to like German or French or whatever? Because there is there is actually a table like it's a it's a number between zero and one. And if I recall correctly, like utter garbage as basically one in 26 because like every letter is random, while an actual language will be more like one in, one in 15 or one in 10. And that's good enough to say, to distinguish garbage from actual like something that looks like real speech. Uh, some purists will argue that this, is, this isn't ciphertext only cracking, which is true. I, don't, I think this is, this is how they actually did the Enigma at home at the time. But again, I was trying more to look at how did the allies do it, and they kind of did the same thing, right? They, they had a plain text, and they just tried to say, can I get a match? This is more trying to, to emulate like an actual bomb than trying to do an entire uh, like full spectrum analysis, because then you probably have to go back to brute force. There are some solutions to avoid going all the way to brute force. Like, for example, I think a, me a mix of index of coincidence and having like some... Uh, some predefined like small sets of letters, like two, three uh, diagram and three gram that you're trying to look for, can also work. Like you know, common. It's 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 basically having a big dictionary of quibs. You don't know where they are. You just assume that if you see enough of them in the message, you're probably uh, on the right track. All right. So C plus plus, right? We use some C plus plus in the code. What did we use? I uh, I'm never I'm, I'm nowhere as fancy as uh, what Daniela had this morning. Uh, I stuck to C plus plus twenty. I didn't want to use like. 23, which is technically not even finished yet and not in most compilers. Uh, so I used a bunch of constexpr actually in constexpr algorithm that helped me like, create the, especially compared to the C program that I, that I, that I looked upon as, a, as, a, as inspiration, uh, that allowed me to remove all the statically generated stuff and in, in, instead just say, hey, just describe me in pure, like, just copy paste the letters of the, uh, of the, of the rollers as you can find them on, uh, on Wikipedia. And I will construct for you the right like uh, 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 wiring in uh, both ways to, to allow, you, allow you to decrypt. Uh, there's a lot of string views and span in the code because again, we have a bunch of text everywhere. We don't need to do copies, uh, use strings or anywhere. So that helped me a bunch to every time I had to manipulate some, uh, some buffers, like messages, keys, things like that. They can just be spanned in string views. Uh, and of course, C++ uh, parallel algorithm just gave me like a 16 uh, time speed up by just like uh, refactoring one for loop. That was, that was really good. The thing I considered but did not use, uh, I tried, thought, thought about using ranges to make the rudder combination, but I'm not super well versed in ranges. I think there is a way to generate a sequence and then feed that to the parallel four but I kind of run out of time to explore it. I thought about like maybe it's a generator, so maybe I could use a coroutine, but then I remembered that there is no like a standard uh, support for coroutines without writing your own library, and this was more like a pet project, so I just, maybe in 23 when we have generators in the standard, I would probably refactor it. Uh, C++ 20 format is, is on me. I completely forgot that it was a thing. I was so persuaded it was not in 20 uh, that I just use a uh, C out. And uh, if uh, Victor ever watched this, I'm really sorry. Uh, I, I meant to use format. I just didn't know it was available. That's on me. Cool. So let's wrap it up. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, Enigma is not a recommended cipher in 2022. <laughs> That's the main takeaway. Uh, a true 60-bit cipher will resist dumb brute force even on modern hardware, uh, at least on the CPU side. I haven't done experiences on the GPU. That could be my next step if I want to explore more options. Again, this is about the same as uh, someone will, will pay to break a, a SHA-1 right now on the market. And uh, apparently the buyout price is about 50K. No, what is Maybe 100K. Between 50K and 100K. Like, that's possible. That's absolutely in the domain of what's, I've, like, if you were at war and you were trying to break the other side, 50K is a small price to pay to be able to read the comms. But as far as one guy with a, with a personal computer, hey, we're not there yet. 
Uh, and again, like, it was just a stupid pet project uh, with like very basic math and very basic uh, code in general. And I still managed to use a bunch of C++ 17 and 20. So I guess like, you know, that means that there is, a, that there is something there. You don't have to go super fancy. Uh, even some very simple pet project can benefit from this. And I thought it was like a good, a good opportunity for me to try. Uh, do you have any questions? Actually, this is a trap. Uh, if you know my talk, you know it's not over because I haven't said the magic words yet. But there's one specific question I expect. Uh, you have one chance to ask it and then you get bonus points. If not, I will just answer it anyway. So does anyone know the secret question you should be asking? I haven't, yes? What is the content of the message? Nice try. <laughs> I, I answered that. But yeah, the message is about uh, the, the German leadership changing because we're about to die and lose. Yes? What's the content of the tweet? Of the? Oh, uh, it's announcing that we're going to make a new expansion. That's uh, boring. <laughs> Have you read Cryptonomicon? What? Have you read Cryptonomicon? No, I don't think I did. But that's not the question I wanted. God damn it. This is the right question. One very important question. What the heck happened to Rejewski and the Polish Cypher Bureau? Wait, you don't understand? Let me go back. Okay. So, remember, right? It's 1939, and they share all their, uh, their findings with France and England in 39, right? And you know, the Allies have spent a lot of effort and money breaking Enigma in World War II. Why have, except the Polish guy, why has nobody ever heard of Rejewski? Why do we all learn about Turing? We know that the Polish government was in exactly London. Where did he go? What happened to him? If you looked at the original slide, he died in the 1980s. So where, what happened? Let's find out. So, it's 1939. Uh, September 1st, Germany is about to invade uh, Poland, and the Polish know that this is not going to go well for them. They, they are already prepared. They have already shared everything they have with the Allies because they're desperate. Uh, Rajewski is in Warsaw uh, with the Polish Cypher Bureau. As soon as the Germans attack, uh, they realize that they're not going to be able to make it. So they evacuate uh, everything they can put on the truck, and they burn everything else so that the Germans don't uh, learn about their attempt at cracking Enigma. Uh, they take a train and they arrive at the Romanian border. Romania is supposed to be neutral in 1939, although they're slowly leaning toward, uh, toward the Germans. Uh, they manage to cross the border. Sadly, they are intercepted really after by the Romanian police, and they know that the Romanian police has a lot of informants to the, for the Germans. Again, they're trying to lean toward, uh, toward the Germans. So they know that if they get captured, there's a high chance they'll be identified and sent back to Germany to be interrogated, and they will want to avoid that. They managed to, use some, uh, to, take, uh, to take advantage of some confusion because there's a lot of Polish refugees at the border that day, and they sleep into the night. They change, uh, they change their passports, they, they take over clothes, they exchange some money, they take a train to Bucharest, and they run to the British Embassy and say, please, I broke Enigma, can you get me in? And the Brits are like, what? Enigma? Never heard of it. Sorry, come back tomorrow. They're like, fuck, night is falling on Budapest, the Germans are looking for them, what are we going to do? They run to the French embassy and say, hey, we broke Enigma, can we get in? And the French is like, let me phone Paris, that sounds important. They do that, and an hour later, the French are like, yes, let them in. They get into the embassy, and using some diplomatic uh, arrangement with Romania, they manage to ferry them to Paris. And in there, the French said, okay, they can have more meetings. Uh, they actually meet with... Uh, they actually meet with, uh, with Turing several times between 1939 and 1940 in Paris because they joined the French Cypher Bureau, and they start cracking again. Uh, they crack a bunch of things. For example, they crack the telegram that says that Denmark is about to be invaded. The Allies do not act on it. They crack the telegram that says that Norway is about to be invaded. The Allies do nothing about it. They crack the Belgian, the French, and the, and, uh, and the Netherlands being about to be invaded, and they again do nothing about it. I mean, it was 1940, and France was really bad at what they were doing. But anyway... Rajewski is not out of his problems, right? Because if we all know something about history, is that, that, that the attack on the, on the lowlands and France in, the, in, in May 1940 doesn't go well for France at all. So Rajewski has to run again. And again, the French Cypher Bureau burns everything down and runs away. A bunch of them gets captured. They get tortured by the, uh, by the German uh, Secret Service. None of them will ever give up the secret that they had a bunch of Poles in the station that were able to read their codes. They managed to get away uh, to uh, North, uh, North Africa, which uh, it at the time uh, technically managed to get away from the invasion and uh, basically joined Vichy France. And from there, they're ferried back to southern Vichy France, on which they start working with the resistance because the resistance is a small cryptogra cryptography unit. It lasts until 1943. 
uh, when the Germans, uh, when uh, the Allies invade North Africa and Germany basically decides to occupy Vichy France, and Rajewski has to flow again. Has to flow again. He runs to the Spanish border. Uh, they, the resistance helps him. They give him a guide to cross the, uh, the mountains into neutral Spain. Uh, the guy betrays them, he takes all their money and their winter clothes and he lets them, uh, he lets them to, to, to just like die in the night. They still manage to cross the, uh, the Pyrenees only to get arrested the next day by the Spanish uh, police who don't know who they are and puts them in prison in Madrid. They spend a couple of months in prison in Madrid until the Polish Red Cross managed to intercede to Franco and say, please let those guys out, they're just mathematicians, why are we keeping them? And from them they managed to get to Portugal and finally from neutral Portugal they make their way to England. And you would think, finally, if they can run to Bletchley, it's late 1943, but they can still help, right? This man is brilliant. But the Brits in 1943 considered that it's too late. Cracking Enigma is a national secret. We can't have foreign nationals working on it. It's too risky. So they put uh, Rajewski behind the desk and say, sorry, you're going to do Sudoku or whatever. We can't tell you about, uh, we can't tell you about Bletchley. But what if? What if? What if they had been less stupid? What if those two had been able to collaborate together when they made the, the machine and then the first computer in a couple of years later? What if? What if instead of going back to Poland and having to basically say nothing about his involvement in World War II, uh, Rajewski had to do because he was afraid that the Polish communists would basically uh, arrest him and send him to Moscow to do more cryptography, but this time for the Soviets. What if he had stayed and they had made together a computer? Imagine what we would have today if the first machine was not invented by just Turing, but those two guys. What if, what if we would have cons by default? <laughs> what if we would have no such thing as like ill form, no diagnostic required, whatever the heck that means? Maybe we would have coroutines in the 90s and even have library support from the get-go. You know, like some people are like, oh, I'll story, something, something, World War I doesn't happen. Ah, nah, 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 nah. But Jeski goes to Turing with Turing at Blessed Part. That's my jam. Uh, if I manage to interest you in that small piece of history and you like tech, uh, you're more than welcome to apply. We're looking for nerds like you. Uh, and with that, furthermore, I think your build should be destroyed. Thank you. And I can actually take your questions now. <laughs> Have you thought about using uh, Amazon or Google renting servers instead of using your own uh, laptop? No, I'm assuming that I could throw, I mean, I could try to throw more cloud at the problem, but the goal was to see, can I crack it with a local machine, right? Because my, my idea was like, this weird German box from the 1920s, like, sure, it took like an entire room of computers to crack it in the 30s, but no one, surely my, lab, my, my desktop can do it. And that's, what, that's the answer I was looking for. The next step would be to try with a GPU, because it's technically not breaking the rules and still using my local gaming rig. Any other question? Well, Team Rajeski, I mean, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>